This is uh, Laws 13017, Civil Procedure. We're looking at week four's tutorial problems nine and 10. Okay. So um, we might get into problem nine. I'll just put up my um, little picture here. It took me for ever to find a picture with a gold-plated Harley Davidson that I'd managed to find one. Um, so here we are. So Davey, Damien was riding his rare gold-plated Harley Davidson motorbike along Dodds Street. Okay, we, we have no idea where Dodds Street is. So that will be one thing you'll need to work out which jurisdiction that's in. Now you can't answer that from the facts you've got. So we've basically assumed it's Queensland. Um, when he was involved in an accident with a train at a level crossing. All right, the train destroyed the Harley and then derailed, causing loss of thousands of litres of motor fuel and pesticide. Uh, Damien sued the train driver for property damage of 810,000. All right, so which court would that put that in, in terms of Queensland? On the jurisdiction issue, which court are we looking at? Would it be the Supreme Court? Okay, so it's the Supreme Court. Then we have a situation where the train driver issues third party notices to various um, entities. All right. So I suppose we should ask what's, what's a third party notice? What's the aim of the third party notice? That is to join that third party to the proposed action. Um, in what way? <laughs> it's partially right. <laughs> With a common cause of action. Between whom? Well, the defendant the defendant becomes the plaintiff and the well, third no, party. Hang on, the defendant to the original to the original cause of action. Yeah now becomes the uh, plaintiff um, in the third party and the third party becomes the defendant in that part of the claim. Yes, good. Very good. Okay, so let's keep going. The train drivers um, issued a third party notice to the state of Queensland seeking damages for his personal injuries. All right, so the original claim was in relation to property damage. There was nothing mentioned about personal injuries. And then this other third party notice relates to personal injuries. So that's something to think about when we get further into this. What about the state of Queensland? Is, is that the proper entity for this train driver to be issuing third party notices to? Well, it depends. Um... If, uh, if he's an employee of a, an incorporated body, um, yes. I, I don't know, I, I think probably Queensland Real is, yep. uh, then the action would be in the name of the incorporated body. But um, if not, um, if it's a state, if he's an employee of the state, the state of Queensland, I think, would be appropriate. Yeah. So basically what you've got to do where in this sort of situation is you have to look for the governing act of the employer and see if there is one. And in this case, there is an act. And we'll look at that a little bit later. So it's actually not the state of Queensland. All right, well, next bit. Ace Proprietary Limited, the manufacturer of level crossing warning bells and Sable Light, the manufacturer, which the company as well, manufacturer of the level crossing warning lights and point system. So there's third party notices issued in relation to them as well. The train driver feels that they were the ones responsible for the accident. Both warning systems failed to act activate at the time of the accident. It's also suspected this is due to a lack of maintenance. All right, so we'll keep going. ACE Proprietary Limited seeks to counterclaim. Well, what's a counterclaim? So this is ACE Proprietary Limited seeking to counterclaim against Damien. Now remember, Damien's the original plaintiff. ACE Proprietary Limited has only been given a third party notice by the original defendant. So is, is that a problem?
you think. It is a problem. So we'll look at that a bit later because that's in, that's a problem in itself. Um, Sorry, Stephen, can I mention something there? Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Um, would it be a, a um, counterclaim or a, or a cross claim? Because um, isn't Damien suing um, the train driver, whereas Sabre Proprietary is um, like it's not, it's not Damien. They're not actually connected, are they? Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to. That's yeah. right. We'll have a look at that. No, you're absolutely right. There's a real problem with how that's structured. Um, all right, we'll keep going. And, and the claims for defamation as well. So that's a completely different sort of situation to the property damage claim and the, the other claim, um, which is a personal injuries associated with the third party notice. So there's real problems with that. Anyway, that, that um, defamation said to arise out of an interview Damien gave with the news channel as he's been cut out of the wreckage of the Harley Davidson. But anyway, so you then got to advise various people. And I always could suggest you do a diagram of these sorts of things. So just, I don't know if I get it all on one page, I'll make it a little bit smaller. So um, what you're asked to do is advise Damien whether he can and should join or serve any further parties and causes of action, referring to the rules and the legislation, advice a train driver and advice aids provide limited of any difficulties. So I think where you start is to actually have a diagram. That's what I've tried to produce here. So basically you can see there you've got Damien, the original claim was against the train driver for personal injuries. I oh, know, sorry, for property damage. Um, then you got the train driver issuing third party notices against the state of Queensland, Sabre Light, and ACE. Okay. You've then got Sabre Light and ACE that they, they want to have a representative proceeding. Now, that's not a class action, so don't fall into that error. Class actions are a bit different, they involve at least, well, usually at least seven parties. So we've only got two. So we're looking at a, um, a representative proceeding, a possibility there. And then there's this notion of a counterclaim going back from Ace to Damien. Okay, so that's your, your scenario. Okay, so we got that clear in our minds what this thing looks like. Uh, Stephen, so uh, just ask a question here. Um, I'm trying to get clear in my head um, parties and causes of action. So in this diagram here, where Damien issues a third party notice to Ace. No, no, it, wasn't, no it wasn't Damien, the train driver. Oh, the, sorry, the train no, driver. No, no, I'm, jump, okay, yeah. I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's only the defendant who can yeah. do the third sorry, party. Sorry, I'll ask my question later. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll get to that, but it's only the defendant who can do that. When you actually yeah, thank you, vision, sorry. Yeah. It, it says that. Okay, so that's our picture. I'll just get rid of that for the minute. Now, um, a few things um, about this. So um, Damien's claim is for personal injury. So it's, it's negligence, a tort of negligence. Um, so we're lacking information about causation. Uh, and all of that has to be specifically pleaded um, uh, in the actions. The Civil Proceedings Act tells you all of that. You know, you're requiring to plead all those sorts of things. Um, so the counterclaim by the, by the, um, um, well, well, the, the actual train drivers trying to say that all of this is due to Sabre Light and ACE and, uh, you know, not actually manufacturing the points and the light systems properly. So there's a real question as to who's responsible for all of this, I suppose what I'm getting at, um, so uh, Damien's only sued the train driver for property damage. The train driver's claiming against his employer, which we've got a doubt about um, it being the state of Queensland. So what should Damien do confronted with this mess? Basically, Damien is the plaintiff. If there's a, a hint or, or more than a hint here that there's potentially other um, entities responsible for what's happened, 
what should Damien do when looking at that? Yep, and you can see there in the chat there, get all of the parties to the table. That's right. So he should be um, considering joining all of those parties as defendants and ultimately let the court work out who's responsible for what. In, in the event that you join someone who you might have a, a valid cause of action, but it turns out they're the wrong party, what's the worst that can happen? They, they Well, the worst that can happen is- It costs you, against them? No, well, if you discontinue- when, we, when you look at discontinuance, if you discontinue against them, then they're entitled to their costs. Mm. So, you know, there is a downside to this, but yeah. the, up, you the don't, you upside don't is- You, you, you don't, don't want to every possible- No, you don't, no, that's, that's right. The, the worst lawyer is the one who sees every possible party, sues the whole lot, and it costs an absolute fortune. The better ones are actually, you pick your party. So you're looking for a party who is responsible, who who, um, who who can actually pay the damages. <laughs> There's no point in, in suing somebody who can't, although some of these um, defendants, if they're all joined, will probably say that they're not wholly responsible for it, but really it's the party who doesn't have any money that's responsible for it. Um, the, the way in which the court looks at it, it wants all of the parties there uh, so that it can make a decision, which then brings me down to what's the whole purpose of joinder? So what is it intended to do? Why do we have all these joinder rules? Well, it helps to minimise the cost of litigation and the time in court when you can join two or three potential cases into one. Yeah, so it's avoiding the multiple, what they call the multiplicity of proceedings because they're, they're putting, you don't want a situation where you have one proceeding another proceeding happening before another judge on the same issues, and then another one later on. Because what can happen, apart from all the costs of the court time and everything involved with that, is you can actually get it, you can actually get inconsistent decisions. And the courts don't want that because that then generates appeals, which even costs more money and time and effort. So it costs the, the state more, you know, provide all the judges, it costs the parties more. So what they do is they avoid that by requiring all of the parties to be in the one case, okay? And then there is another principle known as res judicata. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah, well, you can't re-litigate an issue or re-litigate a, a judgment that's already been handed down. Okay, now we've got to be very clear here. It's not an issue because that's something different. Yeah. It's a judgment. Um, that, or judgment or a, or a um, yeah, judgment on a particular claim. So if that's going to be relitigated, then you have a defence basically of res judicata. It should not be relitigated because what you're doing then is having multiplicity of suits again. So they don't let that happen. And that also extends not only to the, um, the parties, but what they call their privies or persons closely connected to the parties and the claims. So, or, you know, people who should have been in the original um, proceedings if they weren't. And it's, that's also known as cause of action estoppel. Uh, same thing. Um, so it's all designed to prevent multiplicity of suits. Now, we'll go back to the other issue you mentioned, which was issue estoppel. Novel. What's the point of that? That's something different. What's it looking at? It's an issue. That's the key to it. It's looking at an issue. So where there's a judgment on one element or, or an element or an issue that's common to two or more sets of proceedings involving similar parties, then that shouldn't be relitigated because the judgment has made a determination as to what the result is or what the answer is to that particular issue. So again, it's designed to shrink the size of litigations. Why? Because it's all about costs, delay, and access to justice, those three basic principles. It's avoiding costs because you don't have to argue that particular issue because it's already been resolved in relation to issue estoppel. If you're talking about res, res judicata, it's preventing costs of having multiple proceedings. 
then you've got delay. The more court cases you have, the greater the delay. So it's avoiding delay. Um, and by virtue of those two things, it's creating access, better access to justice uh, in the sense that there's more judges to resolve the disputes and it's reducing the cost. So it makes it more economic to the extent that any of this is economic, but it makes it more economic um, to um, have these principles and not relitigate issues. Shall I put my chat on? Okay. So Rachel, how does the apportionment provisions within the Civil Liability Act, which allow a decision to be made against a party who is not present interact with this? So the Civil Liability Act does apply to all litigations. Uh, so um, it works together with the civil procedure rules. So where you have provisions in that act, they will apply. Um, so if they do make a decision against a party who's not present, well, they're going to be bound. They're going to be bound by that. Um, but ideally, you should have a situation where all of the parties have been brought into the litigation. That's how it should be resolved. Uh, Stephen, if I can just ask the question that's itching me now, um, like I would have to have a reason to include all these parties um, in a claim. So um, with respect to uh, the train driver, that's straightforward. Then with the state of Queensland or whatever it is, it's vicarious liability. Yep, and fine. then with Ace and Sabre, is it um, like negligence assuming they were responsible for the maintenance of these warning systems. Yes. Would, it, would that, gets, that gets them all in, does it? Yes. Okay. That's right. Thank but, you. but if you were Damien, you would be suing them for property damage. Because at the moment, he, doesn't, he hasn't brought any claim for personal injuries. It's only That's right, yeah. Damage. So that, his claim would be in relation to property damage. Yeah. But yeah. you get them all in because all of those people and entities are potentially responsible for what has happened right. to, varying, okay. you know, to varying degrees. And there is the economic aspect that uh, both those companies may have deeper pockets than the train driver. Well, probably that's the case. Who knows? You'd have to look at what the companies were worth. But, um, and the train driver, you've got to be careful with the train driver. When you think about it, there's not much a train driver can actually do, is there? They're sitting in the train. It's on a track. It's got nowhere else it can go. All he can do is put his horn on and step on the brake, and that's about it. What else, what else can he do? Um, so, you know, you have to bear that in mind. You might look at it, well, what actually caused this problem? Now, if he didn't brake or he didn't put his horn on, then you might say, well, um, potentially that, those actions indicated that he wasn't watching what he was doing and he took no evasive actions. And therefore, you know, he's, he's responsible for this or, and his, you know, his employer is vicariously liable. So anyway, um, so we're clear on what uh, res judicata is uh, and what joinder is and what issue and stoppel is. So now we come down to um, Damien. So um, if you look at the, who are the necessary parties, there is a, a rule in the UCPR Rule 62, which talks about necessary parties. And there's also uh, Rule 65, which in, talks about including multiple parties in a proceeding. Okay, so if we're looking at this from the perspective of Damien, looking to join Ace and Sabre as defendants, then um, when you look at 62 necessary parties, it says each person whose presence is necessary to enable the court to adjudicate effectively and completely on all the matters in dispute in the proceedings must be included as a party to the proceeding. So there's your primary rule about avoiding multiplicity of suits. Get all of the parties in front of the judge, in front of the court. Okay. Uh, and then 65, inclusion of multiple parties in a proceeding, 65 Sub rule two is the one to look at. Um, and it says, in a proceeding, two or, more, two or more persons may be defendants or respondents if, okay, so at the moment we've only got the train driver, but if there is a doubt as to the person from whom the plaintiff or applicant is entitled to relief, 
So if there's a doubt as to who's responsible, this is a sort of situation where you'd have more than um, one party or the respective amounts for which each may be liable. So again, that comes down to the question who's responsible for what, what's the, you know, the percentage responsibility, if you want to put it that way. Uh, so that's to um, 65 to A and then or, and it says to B, damage or loss has been caused to the plaintiff or applicant by more than one person, whether or not there is a factual connection between the claims apart from the involvement of the plaintiff or the applicant. Now, there is a factual connection here. All of these events are all tied up together. The, the lights, the points, the train on the track, the train driver driving the train, um, and the plaintiff's motorcycle and the plaintiff presumably being on the track at, at that point when there's a collision. So it's clearly all connected. Now, where that would break down is in relation to the defamation claim, because you see, that's not connected. That's an after the event. That's a completely separate type of uh, claim. Um, but in terms of the actual accident itself, all of those events are, are sufficient to enable multiple parties to be joined. Okay, so um, just looking at the, the uh, state of Queensland issue, the, the Act you need to look at as the Queensland Rail Transit Authority Act 2013, section six and seven, which tells you that that's the body um, who sues and can sue or be sued in relation to rail incidents. Okay, Queensland Rail Transit Authority Act 2013. All right, so if Damien has to join all these other people, how does he do that? He's got to amend his claim and statement of claim. So where does he, how does he do that? He's got to rely on another provision of the UCPR. Sixty-nine Or 375 might be better. <laughs> Have a look. Um, 375 is the provision that enables you to amend your claims and statement of claim. What does 69 say? I don't have 69 in front of me. Have you got it in front of you? I can look it up, I suppose, while we're looking. I think that was um, including substituting or removing a party. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Let me find that. Um, I could look that up while we're speaking. Let me see how big it comes in. Um, yeah, let that load. While that's loading, so um, Yee's raised a question there. We're not told in the question that the state of Queensland is the employer. Are they uh, sued because they own or operate the railway? No, well, we've answered that. It's it, the actual operator is that transit authority uh, and they're sued because that transit authority employs the railway driver and they are vicariously liable for the um, driver's actions. Okay, uh, now hang on, we gotta do, what was it, 69? Okay, let's just have a little look at that one. Uh, let's just bring that up, share screen. Oh yeah, okay, let's try and make that a bit bigger. Make it a bit bigger. Okay, including substituting or removing a party. Okay, the person who's been properly, person who has been properly or necessarily included is just to be can be removed, or it's not that. Uh, and then yeah, one B. Any of the following persons may be included as a party. A person whose presence before the court is necessary to enable the court to adjudicate effectively completing. Well, that's definitely the case. Um, those other parties are necessary. Um, but even now that that second head in B2 would be desirable, just and convenient, effectively, Julia would fall within that as well. But I think they're actually necessary to resolve this. But you notice there it says the court may at any stage of a proceeding. So that's actually a discretion. So you'd actually have, you, you're effectively asking the court to exercise that discretion to enable that to happen. 
the only thing that's really critical here actually arises in that second part of that provision about the limitation periods. Um, so that's one thing where courts are um, very sensitive. If you've got a defence based on the limitation period, uh, if you're trying to add somebody uh, who's got a defence or the limitation period has ended and they've, all, they've got a defence, then there's all sorts of specific rules about that, which you can start to see occurring in 69 sub rule two. I see that also applies to uh, 375. Yes, it does. To 376. Yep, it does. And amendments after the limitation period. Yep, yep. So either of those, well, they're not inconsistent, those provisions. And really, I suppose it's um, a bit of duplication in some ways. But anyway, the main point is that um, Damien will be allowed to amend his claim and statement of claim. We've got no problem about limitation periods expiring because you've got three years in relation to the personal injuries part of it. But for the property damage, it's longer. Um, so there's no issue about that on our, our problem. The other aspect of this is that um, what, what do you usually have if you've got a motor vehicle or a motorbike? you'll usually have some form of insurance. So there might be, um, you know, options under the uh, Motor Accident Insurance Act. So we won't go into that. I've just raised that as another possibility here in this sort of scenario. Um, normally you'd be sort of thinking about accidents between cars and <laughs> motorbikes and not with a train, but um, that might be a possibility to look at as well. Uh, Isn't the Motor Accident Insurance Act purely for personal injury? That would be for personal injury. That's right. So it's it's not property damage. So if he did wanted to, if he did want to um, pursue a personal injuries claim, if he had a personal injury, and we're not told that because he's only ever gone for um, property damage, but certainly personal injury, that's what you'd be looking at. Yeah. Well, saying as he was cut from the wreckage, it would seem a little bit. Um... You'd think he would have some, but I mean, we're not, that's the sort of the implication. Um, but at the moment, he's not suing for, for personal injuries. Um, yeah, that's right. Put that in. Okay. All right. So um, now the other aspect to think about as well um, is the, the Civil Liability Act itself um, in Section 52 actually limits the types of um, damages awards you can get. So um, that would be something else just to keep in the background. I mean, our problem today is more about joinder, but I'll just sort of throw these extra issues in there because you can't get exemplary or punitive or aggravated damages. So it does cut down the amount of um, potential damages you can get. Um, so that's something just to keep in the background. But in terms of joinder, are you are you happy or clear in relation to what um, Damien should be doing? Okay, find a new lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. There's a lot of these problems when you actually start to delve into them, isn't there? Anyway, the next thing is you've got to advise the train driver whether the third party notices are valid. Okay, so I might share this screen with you so we actually have a look at the provisions. Okay, so um, looking at these third party notices, remember they are against the state of Queensland, Sabre Light, uh, and the other one I've completely forgotten the name of at the moment. <laughs> um, but anyway, so if you have a look at the provisions, um, all right, so if we look at 191, part provides for third party procedures in a proceeding started, started by a claim. Now we have a proceeding started by a claim and Damien started it, okay? Third party proceeding starts when the third party notice is issued, okay? So that's reliant on the train driver who's issuing that notice. And then you can see then all these provisions in various, um, part of this part and these rules apply in relation to third party notice as if the notice were a claim and the defendant making the claim were a plaintiff. So this is what was um, uh, mentioned earlier, whereby the 
in terms of the third party notice, the train driver who is the defendant to the original claim now becomes a plaintiff in effect and the state of Queensland, say the light and the other one <laughs> um, becomes a defendant in relation to this third party notice. Okay, so just bear that in mind because it can get confusing when you're not used to these things when you know suddenly we have more people and one part of it are known as a defendant, a train driver, but in respect of another aspect of it, they're really a plaintiff because the, the notice is actually perceived as being a claim. Okay, so that's 191. 192, the reason for the third party procedure, a defendant may file a third party notice if the defendant wants to, okay? Now, it's not a contribution or indemnity as such because... Um, there's a problem, isn't it? Because it's not a contribution or indemnity for the property damage because that's in the original head claim. It's about property damage. This third party notice is about um, damages for um, uh, personal injury, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Which, is, um, which means that you're going to rely on 192B, claim against a person who is not already a party to the proceeding, relief relating to or connecting with the original subject matter of the proceeding, and substantially the same as some relief claimed by the plaintiff. Now, you can see that there's, we're starting to get some problems here because it's not actually the same relief claimed by the, as claimed by the original plaintiff. Okay, so... Um, Let's think about that for a second. So let's look at the third party notice to the state of Queensland in respect to personal injuries. Okay, it's a personal injuries. It's not related to the proceedings for Dame, uh, brought by Damien for property damage. So that third party notice is invalid because it doesn't meet the requirements of um, rule 192B. So, um, there's that issue plus the state of Queensland. It's not connected to the to to um, the railway driver anyway because they're not his employer. So they're just like somebody on the street, in effect, or well, the man on the Clapham omnibus, as they used to say. So, um, in which case, it comes back to who exactly was negligent in this matter. The railway driver or the train driver could go right back and counterclaim against Damien for personal injuries. Who's to say that Damien wasn't just idling on the, on no, the track? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So this third party notice for the state of Queensland is, is just flawed on several dimensions, isn't it? All right. Um, what about the third party notice to Ace and Sabre Light? So we're not, it doesn't actually tell you if that's in relation to personal injuries or property damage, I don't think, from memory. So if it is actually in relation to the property damage part of it, then it would fit within the requirements of 192B because it is substantially the same relief as claimed by the plaintiff. So they would be valid. If it was in relation to personal injuries, it wouldn't be valid on the same basis as the state of Queensland one wasn't valid. But if it's property damage, it would have been. Being the property damage relating to the um, Harley Davidson. Okay. But there's also the property damage relating to the train that derailed and it lost thousands of litres of motor fuel yes, but, the, but the train driver doesn't own the train. No, that's right. But his employer could potentially have a suit which is not listed here. Oh, yeah, um, yeah that's, that's right. That could be a whole other... whole other, a whole other little, ball game. A whole yeah. other little diagram <laughs> that we can produce. Yeah, so this, this little accident at the train crossing has got a lot of twists and turns in it when you actually start to look at it. Um, yeah, so that could, be, that could be another action. But anyway, we, we haven't got that on our facts. It's complicated enough as it is. All right, so... Um, if the train driver wanted to include additional parties in a counterclaim, how would that work? Now, the train driver is not counterclaiming against Damien for personal injuries at this point. Okay. 
but he must have been, he or she, we don't, must have been personally injured because they were seeking to make that claim against the state of Queensland. So if Damien um, was contributory negligent or um, that, if they were contributory negligent by leaving their motorbike, for example, on the level crossing, um, then there is a potential for a counterclaim brought by the train driver against Damien. Okay. Now, at the moment, um, the plaintiff is not a party to any counterclaim. But if, if you're going to do that, which provisions would you use? If you have a look at um, 178, UCPR 178, that's the provision that talks about counterclaims against an additional party. Um, but there could be a counterclaim directly against the um, against Damien. Um, but the only way you can get a counterclaim against a person who's not the plaintiff, that's Damien in the original action, would be if the plaintiff was also made a party to the counterclaim. And that's why I mentioned 178. So it is possible to go after other persons other than the plaintiff, but the only way to do that is if the plaintiff is made a party to the counterclaim. Okay. So 178, 179 through to 181, it's all about counterclaims. All right. So that's probably enough there. I mean, there are other provisions which enable a, a train driver to seek what's known as a contribution from the uh, Queensland Rail Transit Authority. And that's under another act known as the Law Reform Act 1995, Queensland Section 63. Um, and that's possible. Um, under the Law Reform Act 1995. So contributions are possible. And when you look at that provision, I'll put that up. So if we have a look at this Law Reform Act 1995, it says proceedings against and contribution between joint and several tort feasors. So tort feasors, they're essentially the ones who are responsible or have caused this breach of a tort. So where damage is suffered by any person as a result of a tort, it doesn't matter if it's a crime or not, and you go down to C, any tort fees are liable in respect of that damage, okay, may recover contribution. So when we talk about contribution, a payment towards the damages that that first tort fees might have to pay, may recover a contribution from any other tort fees who is, okay, so that is who is um, or would if sued have been. So you can see would if sued have been. They haven't been sued, so they're not a party yet. Um, who is liable in respect of the same damage, whether as a joint tort fees or otherwise. Um, so there are other provisions that enable the... Um, um, the train driver to get a, a contribution from other parties. If, for example, um, the um, plaintiff hasn't joined these persons who received this third party notices as defendants. So there is a, a way of doing that through this backdoor route under this provision. But anyway, look, I think for our purposes at the moment, I've included that there, it's, but that's probably more than I'm expecting you to know. I think what we really need to ensure at the moment is that you understand the basic principles in relation to res judicata, issue estoppel, you know what that means, that you understand um, that the plaintiff sues the defendant, that the defendant can issue third party notices, um, but to be valid, they have to be in relation to the same events or causes of action and um, in this case, damages brought by the original plaintiff. That you need also to be very aware of who potentially can be liable both as a defendant and as, or under a third party notice when you're confronted with something 
like state governments, where they have lots of agencies and bodies. You need to look in, in the respective um, acts that govern those agencies to see uh, in what name they can be sued. Because if you commence your proceedings in the state of Queensland, they could could easily argue, well, we're not a we're not a valid defendant because um, there's an act that says who the defendant is, and it's not us. So that's what I'm really um, concerned with when you're confronting problems like this. Okay, so some of these uh, things that I've included there, like these contributions, that's getting a lot more advanced than I'm expecting. Um, so don't be too concerned about that last little bit. All right, it's the basic principles we want to make sure that you understand. Now, the, ne the next bit of it um, is you've got to advise Ace Proprietor Limited of any difficulties with its counterclaim and in representing Sabre Light. So Ace Proprietary Limited has got a problem because it can't counterclaim against Damien. And the reason is, that ACE is not a defendant. It's a defendant who brings a counterclaim. And um, ACE Proprietary Limited is not a defendant in the proceedings brought by Damien. They're only a defendant to the third party notice, which is the secondary proceedings, not the original head proceedings. If, uh, if Damien were to join ACE... If Damien joined them, yes. If they were joined as a defendant, yes, they can then have a counterclaim. But he hasn't but, done that yet. Uh, is ACE prevented from bringing a completely separate suit against Damien for, was it uh, defamation? Um, Outside of uh, <laughs> the existing. What I'm saying is if, if, uh, no. Damien, if Damien doesn't join ACE, that's not going to necessarily prevent ACE from bringing a, an independent separate... No, but you've got another suit. problem. The Defamation Act, Section 9, says corporations can't sue for defamation. <laughs> so don't, don't join... Don't join there, are some except, there are some exceptions and things here, but none of them help. So, yeah, watch out for weird provisions like that in other bits of legislation. So if, perhaps you should put that up because it, it's... It's quite interesting when you look at that because it's not something you'd sort of naturally think of. So here's the provision here in the Defamation Act. It says certain corporations do not have a cause of action for defamation. A corporation has no cause of action for defamation in relation to the publication of a defamatory matter about the corporation unless it was an excluded corporation at the time of the publication. It really takes you back to statutory interpretation, this, doesn't it? So the next thing is what the what is an excluded corporation? Okay, and then it tells you, a corporation is an excluded corporation if the objects for which it is formed do not include obtaining financial gain for its members or corporators. So that's not going to fit, I would have thought, say the light, because I suspect they're in the business of making these lights and things to make a profit. So it's not, not for profit type corporations would be excluded. Or, and it says or, so there are alternatives. Next bit. It has fewer than 10 employees and is not an associated entity of, of another corporation. So we would have to look at how many employees Sable Light has. Um, if they have fewer than 10, then they'd be an excluded corporation and then they could sue for defamation. <laughs> but if they're, big, if they're bigger, they can't. Isn't that a weird provision? But anyway, that's the problem with the defamation matter. Yeah, so you've really got to keep your mind open when you're looking at the parties to a litigation and the potential claims. And if there's legislation around any of those things, you've got to work your way through it. Make sure there's none of these provisions that can catch you out like that one would. That'll catch out most people because you don't necessarily think, oh, there's something in the Defamation Act about that. But there you go. All right. Um, now, so that ended the defamation claim. The, um, the other one is this notion of a representative party. Okay, so the provisions there um, 
the main thing I want you to, to be cognizant of is that a representative action is different from a class action. They're different and distinct, but they're, they look fairly similar on the face of it, but they are different, they have different rules. So essentially a class action is a much bigger sort of um, action than a representative proceeding. So for class action, you've got to have at least seven group members. That's under the Civil Proceedings Act 2011, section um, 103B. Now a representative party, a representative proceeding, you have a look at UCPR, Rule 75, and it says a proceeding may be started and continued by or against one or more persons. So, you know, it's, it's not limited to seven or anything, um, who have the same interest in the subject matter of the proceeding as representing all of the persons who have the same interest and could have been parties in the proceeding. So you've got to look at what same interest is and the sorts of things that are relevant there is there's a common interest, grievance or relief that they're all trying to seek. Um, and then uh, UCPR Rule 76 talks about the and making getting an order for representation. Now, it says at any stage of a proceeding brought by or against a number of persons who have the same interest under Rule 75, the court may, so there's the discretion, the court may appoint one or more parties named in the proceeding or another person to represent for the proceeding the persons having the same interest. Um, so ideally what you would want would be Sabre giving authority to ACE to be its representative. That would be handy. Um, but that's not fatal because the court has a discretion, but you're going to actually have to bring an interlocutory application to get that court order. So it's going to cost you money to do that, but it would, nice, it would be nice if it was a consent order. It's a lot cheaper. There's no argument. Um, but if there's an argument around who's representing whom, that, you know, you, you're looking at your usual $5,000 plus cost to resolve that um, question. So the answer to that is yes, you can have a representative proceeding. Uh, the court can order it. There, there would need to be an interlocutory application. You'd hope that it was a consent order. So you would have uh, Sabre should be, um, or, or who is going to be the representative should be asking the other one they want to represent for their consent to, to make it easier. All right, so just having a quick look down that chat again. Um, yeah, if the third party notices are invalid, does it mean the train driver needs to insure separate company etc. Yes, yes, that's right. All right, all right. You had enough of that problem? <laughs> all right, got 15 minutes to do the next one. I'll put up my little um, picture of the car. There you go. All right, so the next one, on the 4th of November last year, Christopher Chase <laughs> was involved in a motor vehicle accident in which he suffered personal injuries and property damage, okay? So he was injured and damaged to his brand new Porsche, okay? On the 20th of January this year, um, his solicitors issued and served a statement of claim in respect of the property damage, so they forgot to include the personal injuries. Okay, on the 25th of March this year, the defendant Nancy Reardon delivered her defense. So we've then got the defendant putting in their defense um, before there's this um, attempt to amend the statement of claim to add the damages for personal injuries as well as for the property damage. Now, what's the impact of that on Nancy, who's the defendant? What's the problem here from her perspective? Well, she, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Vivian. Yeah, Vivian, what did you want to say? That's okay. Expenses should have spent money already. That's right. She's forked out the costs for her solicitors to brief a barrister, probably. Um, only in respect to property damage. And now all of a sudden it now has got a damages claim. So they've got to now prepare and brief the barrister again. So all of that all of that costs money. Maybe the solicitor's firm did it all, but it's still going to add costs. 
uh, and it would have been cheaper if it was all done at the same time. So um, that's that's the problem. So, ah, oh yeah, that's probably, I should look, look that up, I had a little diagram. I like these little diagrams. Um, so there you have it. Uh, the accident was on the 4th of the 11th, and I put X minus one, meaning that it was this year minus one. Um, a service and statement of claim property damage. So there was 77 days or thereabouts between those events, 64 days between service of the statement of claim and the defence being delivered, and then a 10 days after that, the amendment of the statement of claim. So why have I got all of these dates in there? Why, why have I put the days in? What should Christopher Chase's lawyers have done during that 77 day, um, oh, well, no, after service actually, during that 64 day period after service of the statement of claim, claim and statement of claim. What should they have done in that 64 day period? They should have, got, okay. They should have what, sorry, Vivian, what did you say? They should have got a default judgment. I think somebody yes. just mentioned it in the chat. They could have got a default judgment. And how many days after service of the statement of claim could they after have done that? Days. 28 days. They could okay. have got a default judgment in relation to the property damage. Um, anyway, they didn't do that. Um, the defence was delivered and so it went on. Okay. I just want to point that out because, you know, um, that was a bit of an error on their part. If they're seeking to amend, you can, um, you know, it comes back to these provisions we were talking about uh, earlier. There's a power to amend under Rule 375. Um, so that says you can amend at any stage of the proceeding or at any stage of the proceeding, the court may allow, again, Wherever you see the word may associated with the court, it's a discretion. May allow or direct a party to amend a claim, anything written in the claim, a pleading, et cetera. Um, and then it says the court may give leave to make an amendment, even if the effect of the amendment would be to include a cause of action arising after the proceeding was started. That's what we've got here, isn't it? It's a different cause. It's a different cause of action, because one was in relation to property damage, and the other one's in relation to personal injuries. So it is possible under Rule three seven five sub Rule two for the court to give leave for that to occur. So um, there isn't an issue in terms of the limitation period. So those provisions relating to Rule three seven six don't apply. Um, but 377 talks about amendment of the originating process. So you would have to amend the claim as well. That's the originating process. And you will need leave of the court. So there's going to have to be um, an application to seek leave of the court to amend the originating process to include this other claim, and then to amend the pleading, which is the statement of claim as well. There's two things. Um, so it'll then come back down to the question, will leave be granted? Okay, so Nancy might may well object and say, you know, I've got all of this added cost, I've suffered all this prejudice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so you can see how she'll argue all of that. So um, there's case law on this. So I've included a few cases. Um, since it's it's a discretion, all sorts of things can arise. So what we know what Nancy will be arguing. What will um, our um, plaintiff be arguing here? What's Christopher Chase going to argue? What's his argument? We're all in front of the, you know, the chamber judge now. What's the argument going to be for Christopher, Christopher Chase? So how would you approach it? If you think about it, how would you approach this question? You've stuffed up basically, haven't you? Well, at least so I've, got some, enough, I've got something in mind, but I don't think it applies here. It's more to do with the negligence of your lawyer in no. the fact you, you instructed your lawyers to yeah, yeah. proceed. People make, but people make mistakes. They drop the ball. 
they dropped the ball and you know you would you certainly wouldn't be expecting a bill from them would you <laughs> um, so what what's your argument going to be to the judge who's now looking at you and tapping the bench and saying you know if you're not going to say anything you're going to be chuffed out of the chamber court so what are you going to say what's your argument is it a situation where you should confess and avoid you know what i mean by that is say um you know the barrister stands up we acknowledge that um the um the pleadings omitted or the claim and the statement of claim omitted to include this other claim and you know, and that they um, acknowledge that this has potentially caused some prejudice and um, added cost to the to the plaintiff. So that's your confession. And then the avoiding bit would be what? What's the other part of the argument? So it's confess and avoid. So what's the avoid bit? What would you say? You'd say that it's not in um, the court's interest or in um, the interest of the plaintiff that he's unable to make a claim for personal injuries, particularly into the future and for the losses that he's going to suffer. Well, that's right. We, firstly, you would be saying, well, that's, that's the sort of multiplicity of proceedings bit of it. But the other bit is you could say, you know, we acknowledge that there's been some prejudice and that there has been some cost, but that can be cured. We can compensate the, um, the defendant for the costs incurred. We're willing to pay those. Uh, it, and we'd be saying that the prejudice is, is minimal. There's been no um, expiry of a limitation period. Um, uh, there's been no death of a witness or anything like that. And that, um, um, that really their loss and prejudice can be compensated. And it's in the interests of justice that the whole proceeding be determined. Um, through this amendment. And uh, you can refer to cases like Aon Risk in Services and the Australian National University um, that, um, you know, you don't want to clog up the courts with multiple proceedings. And, you know, that Aon one was a bit different because uh, we're talking about a situation which is very early on in the litigation. It's not as if it's right at the end of the case where a lot more costs have been incurred, um, it's early on. So they're the sorts of arguments that you would be um, running. Um, and um, the court will make its decision based on those, you know, what it considers the weight of those competing arguments to be. Um, so Natalie's saying that you certainly don't admit liability in terms of the claim, but I mean, I don't think it's, it's, um, it's wrong to um, recognize the fact that you made an error in not including that in the original claim. You're not admitting liability to the claim, for example, um, but you know, you, you don't have to confess. You can just say that uh, you can just, just have the avoidance part of it if you want and just say that um, you know the prejudice can and the cost can be cured and that you're willing to compensate the um, the plaintiff's costs that have been lost because of this um, situation I suppose there's an element though of saying look we did we didn't change our mind and, and decide to add this at the last minute that we did forget it was an error on our part yeah. That's, there may be some. There may be some benefit to making that admission. Yeah, that's that. I think there is some benefit in doing it, but you don't have to. But you do have to cover the prejudice and cost issue, because that's the key argument that the um, defendant will have. It comes down to legal linguistics as well. Say sorry, an, that, sorry, say that again, Lindsay. It comes down to legal linguistics as well. An error oh. was made, not we made a mistake. Well, yeah, an error. <laughs> true. <laughs> so, Stephen, if the court says no, declines your application, are you? Best well, you're um, you're stuck with it unless you want to try and take it on appeal. Do you just dis discontinue the proceedings and start again, or would well, you, you, you could actually discontinue, and then um, the net result of that would be that you would have to pay all of the costs of the um, 
defendant, but it's still within the limitation period. So you could start again um, and do it properly. So there's always that. But of course, if there'd been a limitation period intervening, that would be another story. But um, on our facts, we don't have that problem. Yeah, you could discontinue and start again. But um, potentially you might have you to pay more costs. <laughs> you, can, you can start again with a new law firm and then sue the previous one for negligence to recover well, that. You could. You, you could. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's best to avoid litigation in the first place. <laughs> You don't, want to, you don't want to have compounding litigations. You certainly don't want to have the bill from that law firm. You shouldn't be charged where they've stuffed up like that. Um, but your damages, I mean, what, what actually is your damages when you think about it? You're still able to bring your claim. You've had to compensate the, your damage is basically going to be what you'd have to compensate the defendant if you, with, if you um, didn't continue with the proceedings and then had to start again. That'll be, the, that'll be the extent of it. So it's not going to be a huge amount of money. Uh, so the cost of doing that mightn't be worth it. It might just be a case of, of sticking with your, um, either sticking with your law firm and getting them to fix it so that they're going to carry the costs of a lot of that. Um, and you, you, would, you would know what those costs would be from the um, scale of fees and the UCPR when you can... Well, yeah, and you can always change solicitors. You know, you can fix that mess up with the existing ones if you wanted to, and then change solicitors after that. Um, so, but anyway, look, you just got to bear in mind the costs. Taking litigation or you know, commencing litigation is not something you do lightly. It's a really, really expensive. Um, and the last thing you need is two sets of lawyers' bills. So this is an unfortunate situation. So I think. If it was me, I would be getting that law firm to fix up the situation and not be expecting to receive any bill in relation to that. And I would be expecting that the law firm would be paying the costs. Uh, in fact, the courts can order that too. Is, is it fair to summarise the situation as a damage limitation exercise for both the law firm and the plaintiff? Yes. Yeah. You're really trying to minimise the costs and expenses of all of this. Um, and if you're rational, not well, if you're rational about it, you look for the cheapest way. But then again, not everyone is rational. So, you know, realistically, you want to keep the cost down as, as much as possible and get this action framed properly um, and then go from, go from there. I mean, they've stuffed up a few times. They've stuffed up in framing the action. They've stuffed up by not getting a default judgment <laughs> or pre you know, they should have done that. That would have been dead easy. Um, that's not to say it couldn't have been set aside. But then the defendant would have been paying you the costs of that. So anyway. All right. That is basically it. 702, look at that. We're actually a bit better on time this week. So um, how's the assignment going? Are you starting to get into that? Yep. No one's saying anything. All right. Yes, yes, we have broken ground, yes. Broken ground. Well, that's good. You want to make sure you start that. Um, um, Stephen, may I ask a question? Um, when I read about uh, a registrar in mm -hmm. the Act, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. is that a judge who has assumed a particular role or is uh, it a separate? Can uh, you just a registrar explain? registrar is essentially an administrative officer. So registrars are employed by the government. Judicial officers are a different branch of government. So you've got uh, effectively the Department of Justice who employs the registrars, and then you've got judicial officers. It is possible to, <laughs> to make it more confusing, it is possible to have judicial registrars. So they, they're, they're still not judges, but they can be delegated some of the judicial powers, but they're still employees of the um, of the state of Queensland. And they are legally trained persons? Uh, to, well, these days they tend to be, but historically, no. Um, no. Yeah, so no, some no. of your registrars will be officers, you know, they'll be people on the counter in the, um, in the registry. So then they're, they're, judicial, they're not judicial officers. They're completely separate 
branch. Yeah. Okay. But they're very important. The whole place wouldn't function without them. Well, it's just they, they give me cause for thought when I saw some of the decisions that they're empowered to make. Mm. Same um, thing I thought, of, Ivan. They they uh, they really do. Uh... They're simple matters. They they've, they've been given simple matters to free up the time of the judges to deal with more complex matters, essentially. Stuff like they're administrative sort of things, like a default judgment. They'll bring you. Essentially, you will have all of the documentation, and they will check through it to make sure that everything's there before it's, you know, stamped in the registry. So they, you know, that's basically their role. Um, even judges' associates, uh, they can have because uh, they they have roles as well. So they're sheriffs as. <laughs> They have multiple roles. So um, anyway, that's a whole other issue. Anyway, now registrars are judicial officers. They're administrative people employed by the, essentially the Department of Justice, whereas the judges aren't employed by the government. They're a completely separate branch of government. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So we're reading week five material. That's good. Have a read through that. Be conscious of the amount involved and look for the cheapest option. That's my advice on this. If you go for more expensive options, you won't be wrong, but the cheaper option is always the best result for your client. If, if the options include QCAT, where you're not necessarily going to be allowed to represent your client, although it's cheaper, is it necessarily going to get them a better result? Well, you're not representing them in the set. You can give them advice as to how they might fill in various forms, but you're not. You can write their pleadings for them. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not. You're not sort of arguing in in the face of the tribunal. But you can assist them with documents. Yes. Yes. And then you have to need. You need to look at the costs of those approaches, and then if you get the final result, if you go that tribunal route, how do you then, you know, how do you then enforce it? and um, et cetera. How do you do interstate service? How do you, um, can you get a default judgment? Can you, how do you enforce a QCAT default judgment? So you need to look at all of those sorts of things and, and the various costs, because there's links between QCAT and the magistrate's court. So there's avenues for getting things registered. And it's, um, so it all comes down to costs as well. So have a good look at what the costs are of filing in a magistrate's court. What's the cost of filing in somewhere like QCAT? Um, how, and the forms that you fill in and ultimately, uh, how do you get it enforced? Because remember, you're trying to help your client to ultimately get compensated. So have a think about all those sorts of issues. There's plenty of materials about QCAT. Um, um, on the on their website, it's full of it. And they have good search terms and things. There's lots of materials because it's designed to help self-litigants do things. But um, it can be could be used for people who have some a little bit of advice as well. But it's not um, you're not acting in the face of the you know, you're not turning up to the tribunal and arguing it for the person. That's a different sort of situation. Okay. All right, we might stop there. It's good to see you all. So um, persevere, get stuck into that this weekend and um, get that out of the way and then we can, um, we can move on. Now, next week, I'm just thinking the timing of everything. If the next week's tutorial... Um, is it not mid-semester break next week? Okay, is it mid-semester break? You so actually take it, Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just thinking, I mean, what I can do to help you, I'm just, I'll have to have a look at what the, um, see what the next questions are, uh, whether... There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, but um, maybe what I can do is, is, is give you some answer guides to those in advance, so that if any of those are relevant to your um, um, assignment, then you've got the advantage of that. Is that fair enough? Sounds good. 
Okay, and then we can um, come back uh, if next week's <clears throat> mid semester break. Now we're quick, isn't it? Uh, then we can come back the week after. We'll go through the problems and, um, and discuss them. How about we do that? All right. Okay. We'll call it a night. And, um, Thank you. Yeah. Next week, the week after. Thanks. Bye. Thank okay. you, everybody. Okay. Bye.